morning everyone this is dr meenakshi sundaram we are now going to be listening to dr asif sheik who is from the cleveland ohio he is going to be talking to us about eye movements and movement disorders a rather attractive title shaky eyes in a shaky body asif please okay thank you dr sundaram um, and thank you dr kotari for uh, this uh, kind invitation it's uh, it's been a pleasure um to be here um i mean not in cleveland of course uh to talk to you guys um but um it's it, this is a very special occasion for me because this is the first time uh, so as some of you may know i am from india i i grew up in india i came to america about 20 years ago and this is the first time in 20 years i am talking to audience back home in india so this is actually one of the best opportunities for me to reconnect with my people uh, i'm i'm really really touched with this uh, and i'm really hoping to have more opportunities of this sort uh, when i can connect uh, more with uh, my colleagues in india uh, so um Uh, I want to thank uh, my mentors David Z and John Lee and everything that I learned in my life in my professional and my personal life a lot of things I learned from them they're like my academic parents and um anything that you like in this lecture I inherited from them anything that you don't like in this lecture that is mine so keep that in mind so with that let's start So John Lee always caught told me that there is hardly a corner of the brain that is not concerned with the control of eye movements and uh that follows that eye movements can often assist the bedside diagnosis of movement disorders not only movement disorder i would say any neurological disorder and uh that that is really true and you will see that in next hour hour and a half uh long talk uh today So we have few learning objectives uh, so first is we will overview some basic concepts of eye movements and vestibular system because they are not bolts to uh, understand the system and then apply that knowledge uh, to um, to delineate several movement disorders or to identify some problems in the movement disorders then we will recognize some anatomical and physiological substrates where the disorders of eye movements intersect with common eye movement is common movement disorders and then um how we can use uh, various eye movements as a prototype to understand some common movement disorders and of course we will also have some typical cases and i will keep you alert by asking you some some difficult and some easy questions So what purpose do the eye movements serve? So of course the most important thing is holding the image on the retina. That is the most important. So we acquire that with a movements called gaze holding eye movements, right? Now uh I'm not going to cover that a lot in this lecture but actually gaze holding is holding the eyes but you do need some tiny movements to hold gaze. So that is actually gaze holding eye movements so that is correct. So over here um I'm going to show you a video where this person has a uh, unclear some kind of eye movements and then eventually uh, you will see what happens if you have similar type of eye movements. So what you can see here is that as she is trying to hold the gaze on an object which is in front she is having these pendular oscillations of the eyes. and then if normal person looks at this dot it looks like this but if you have a pendular oscillation then this dot would constantly oscillate as you can see that in this um uh, in this video here so it becomes very annoying it becomes very disturbing and it becomes a real problem in the vision when you see a dot constantly moving and you, when it it degrades your visual acuity substantially and uh second is of course uh by keeping the eyes steady uh we point our phobia at features of interest so as you can tell here in these arrows this is your phobia and this phobia is where uh, the highest density of photoreceptors is your camera is the best has 4k resolution or they are probably even better than 4k uh 
As you go farther away from the fovea, your visual acuity robustly decreases. And therefore, what your eyes do is they basically shift that little camera, which is very high resolution, from one object to the other. So let's say when I'm, when I'm looking at my computer screen or when you're looking at your computer screen, when you look at one or when you look at two, you shift your gaze from one point to the other. And in order to do that, you need to make some gaze shifting eye movements. So gaze holding eye movements and gaze shifting eye movements and gaze holding eye movements is visual fixation. So visual fixation uh, is basically you give subject a target. Uh, sometimes I use my finger, sometimes I use red pen or red object, red stick, and ask people to just look at it. And I look at it from, um, uh, look at it from far and, and take a look at uh, their eyes to see whether there are any unwanted eye movements or not. And then you ask the same person to hold eyes on an eccentric position. So you move the target to the right or to the left, up or down, and then ask them to uh, focus their eyes on the eccentric gaze. And that allows you to measure eccentric eye movement. And of course, as you are, you're not always steady, right? In your life, you always walk around, you move your head, you drive your car, you drive your scooters. Uh, as you do that, your head constantly moves. And as your head constantly moves, your eye needs to keep your uh, fovea steady on a target which is not moving with you. And in order to do that, your brain makes a type of eye movements which are directly equal to that of your head movements, but they are in the opposite direction and what we call vestibular ocular reflexes. And as you're looking at the train or as you're looking at moving traffic, you kind of like move your eyes with it, what we call optokinetic reflexes. So these are all different types of uh, reflexes or all different type of reflexive eye movements that nature has given us. And the purpose of all those is to basically keep very high resolution camera, in other words, fovea, on the target of interest. That's the million dollar thing or million rupee thing. And then you are looking at gaze shifting eye movements. So the most important one is saccades. So these saccades are actually very interesting. Every day, a normal average human makes thousands and thousands of saccades. We make saccades typically at the rate of one to two hertz. Tiny saccades at the rate of one to two hertz. Your eyes are constantly in motion. These are the most commonly made eye movements by human brain. You don't even know about them and they happen. And that is very important because you want to capture the image of your surrounds very precisely and very clearly. And that's why nature has given us the cards. And smooth pursuits are uh, actually ocular following. And ocular following is used when people are moving around you, when traffic is moving around you, and when you want to look at that uh, traffic, or when you want to take a look at the people who are moving around you, you have to keep your eyes, gaze following them. And although we call it smooth pursuit in a purest way, smooth pursuit is, it's not really smooth pursuit, it's ocular following. But as clinicians, for all intents and purposes, we call that smooth pursuit, which is okay. And of course, virgins is also very important as movement disorder specialists even more important. And I will explain to you. Um, so virgins is, we don't, we, we don't live in two dimensional world. We live in three dimensional world. We want to look at the object which is far away. And then when I want to focus back on my computer, my eyes need to go apart from each other and close to each other. So you make a divergence, which is both eyes go away from each other, and convergence, both eyes go close to each other. And that is a virgin eye movement. And that gives you a perception of your depth, which is very important for three-dimensional um, view. And it's, it's actually very important for certain Parkinsonian syndromes uh, in particular. So virgins is very important for a movement disorder neurologist. So first, let's talk about some gaze holding eye movement, and especially I'm gonna focus on how you would examine them initially and how, what to look out for.
So of course you give them a fixation target in the central position. So typically I stay on the side of the patient. I give them the thumb in front of their eyes. I keep them about a meter or far more than a meter distance from their eyes to make sure that they don't have to make convergence. And I ask them to look at the target. As they're looking at the target, I look at their eye very carefully. It's very important to pay attention to the eyes um, as it is focusing on, diff on, on different targets. As they're doing it, you look for certain kind of eye movements. So one of them is saccadic intrusions or some sort of oscillations. So for example, in this patient, he has some sort of saccadic oscillation. So he's looking at the target, but as he's looking at the target, as you will see, he has his back and back to back. And close your eyes gently. Movements, which. And open them up. Doing perfectly. Right there. Look at the camera. So these are saccadic intrusions, and we will get into the details of that a little bit later. But the goal this person has is to focus on the target, but he's not able to focus it, and the eyes are constantly moving. Then you want to look for the nystagmus. We will have lots of videos for nystagmus, so we'll get to that. Uh, and as you are looking at the nystagmus, you want to look at the gaze, which is at the center. And then you want to ask people to move the gaze to the right or to the left or up or down and the focus on the targets in each of these eccentricities and look at certain forms of nystagmus. The, the most common nystagmus is gaze evoked nystagmus. And at certain level, it is actually physiological, but beyond certain intensity, it becomes pathological. So for example, this person in this video, eyes are very steady, straight ahead, and when looking to the right side, you are seeing the beats of the eyes to the right side, and it is drifting towards the center. And now when it goes back to center, the beats are now in the opposite direction. In other words, there was a gazy of nystagmus and then again, you have a gazy of nystagmus. Now it beats the left side, and when it will go to the center, the beat reverses. You see that? So always, gazy of nystagmus is associated with a nystagmus back on the primary position, central position, but the beat is uh, switched, reversed, and what we call a rebound nystagmus. So most commonly, gaze evoked nystagmus is associated with rebound nystagmus. So these are the two pair of nystagmus that you want to look for. And that is actually pathognomonic for certain features, which we will get to in a minute. Then you want to do vestibular testing. The most important test here is head impulse test. Now, we have to, you have to be very careful when you do head impulse tests. Head impulses should be very rapid. They should be fast. In a purest vestibular way, we say that it should be at least 10,000 degrees per second square of acceleration, which is a lot, lot bigger acceleration. You really need to have good muscles to do that. I cannot get to that. I don't have that big muscles to get that. I can get to about seven, 8,000, but ideal is 10,000 degrees per second square. Uh, but your excursion should be very small. You can't give a big excursion, otherwise you're gonna give patient a dissection. So you have to do a small excursion, but very rapid jerks of the head movements, and you will see that in a subsequent section. So why you need that? Because vestibular movements are very prompt and visual movements are slow. So what happens is when you do head impulses, and if you don't have vestibular system, then you are going, your brain is going to recruit the visual system and you are going to see something. You are going to see some sort of corrective saccade. So take a look at this video, particularly pay attention to how fast and how brisk, but how small excursion these head impulses are. And as you are looking at that, we look right at the camera. See, they are very small, but they are I very fast. And as you see, when it goes from Perfectly the right side of the patient, the right. the there is no correction. Catch up the side, looks, there is correction. He moves his head to the left. Normal when he moves his head to the right. 
normal and it was right. So what happens is whenever patient's head is impulsing to the right side, there is a catch-up saccade, and on the left side, there is no catch-up saccade. What that means is that this person has uh, one side vestibular system where the catch-up saccades are present is hypofunctioning. This is a very sensitive test to measure the vestibular uh, function at bedside. Then you want to look at the gaze shifting eye movements. So you want to look at the saccade between two stationary visual targets. So ideally what I do is you don't want to move your pen from center to the right. Uh, that is not really going to serve the purpose. What I do is I ask them to look at my nose when I'm sitting right in front of them and give them an eccentric target to the left side or to the right side, for example, a thumb or a pen, and have them take a look at the pen. The other thing that you want to keep, uh, keep in mind is that the eccentric target should not be really far away because they have, in that case, they have to make a bigger saccade. And in some patients, they, especially in our elderly population who have movement disorders, they, they sometimes have restriction in the orbit. So uh, you want to give us, you want to take, take a look at the smaller size saccade. So what I do is I uh, show them my finger and my pinky and my thumb like this, and I tell them to look at my thumb and then my pinky and the thumb and my pinky. Or you can hold a pen horizontally and then have take a look at right or the left of the pen. And that makes a very small, about 20 degree brisk saccades and that gives you a very good measure of saccade velocity. It's very sensitive. You wanna measure saccades in the horizontal direction, in vertical direction, right, left, up, down, and also diagonally. Diagonal is important, especially in patients with PSP. As they are making a saccade, you want to see how easily they initiate the saccade and whether they have any kind of increased reaction time, and it is seen in patients with ocular motor apraxia. For example, take a look at this patient. Oh, yeah. uh -huh. And look at me. Make a saccade. And look at your sister. This is excellent. Look at me. All right. And look at your mom. So she's not able to make a saccade. Okay, and look at instead me. Instead of she's making a head move. Uh -huh. And look at your sister. And look at me. And look at mom. And look at me. All right. Now look way up. Way up high. And look way down. Yeah, turn your head up all the way. Move your head. Head all the way. Yeah, now look way up. Turn your head all the way. Look up to the ceiling. Up to the ceiling. Yeah, and look way down. All right, now look at me. So this is a very classic example of ocular motor apraxia, and I will quiz you on the diagnosis later on. Then you want to take a look at the accuracy. So how easily saccade is initiated and how accurate the saccade is, because it is equally important. So this patient had a problem in accuracy. So as you can see, the patient is making a saccade to the right or the left, but when he's making it, he has to make several back to back and forth dysmetric movements, and then finally he reaches the target. So he has a substantial amount of dysmetria at the end, and that is also pathognomonic, and that suggests of not very good accuracy of the saccades. And then you want to look at the conjugacy, and there are several slides, uh, and very soon you will see where you will see the deficits in conjugacy, which is uh, intranuclear ophthalmoplegia. And then you want to look at the speed and direction. Now, this is very important. Uh, as Parkinson patients or progressive sucralinicular palsy patient, you want to look at the speed of the saccade, but at the same time, you also want to look at the direction of the saccades. So, for example, around the houses. So this is a classic example of a slow saccade in a very early course is not straight, but it kind of goes curved, and what we call them is round the houses. So this is one of my patients with PSP. Finger. As you can see. Camera. So the vertical scuds are not only Finger. slow, but she's making a little Camera. curvature. And it's not actually curvature. Finger. It's actually serpentine. It goes like a little serpentine trajectory. So actually I round the houses open. sign, I call it a serpentine Finger. Saccade. Camera. Finger. 
camera finger. So that is pretty classic. So what causes these different types of eye movement? So let's dive into a little bit of a brainstem anatomy and how various disorders affects the brainstem anatomy. So we'll start with the pons and horizontal gaze. So you got your brainstem, you got your two eyes, you got your lateral rectus and the medial rectus, uh, you got your pons here, you got your midbrain, you have an abducens nucleus, you have your oculomotor nucleus. So now let's say if you want to make a saccade to the left side. So in order to make a saccade to the left side, you need to activate your lateral rectus and the medial rectus. So abducens nucleus is going to innervate your lateral rectus uh, via lateral rectus motor neurons in the abducens nerve. And then the same abducens nucleus is then going to talk to the ocular motor nucleus on the opposite side of the brain via abducens interneurons, which passes from the medial longitudinal fasciculus, and then it is gonna to go to medial rectus motor neurons. So by activating this pairs of what we call yoked muscles, your eyes are gonna to move to the left side. Now this circuit is very strategic because it has another mechanism called virgins mechanism. So if you want to make a virgins, then virgins is actually going to innervate only the oculomotor nucleus on both sides and your eyes are going to converge. In that case, it will look closer. And then this mechanism is gonna spare your medial longitudinal fasciculus. So that is differentiating between virgins and the yoke dye movements are going to give you a very important diagnostic marker of certain type of eye movement or localization of certain type of disorders. So abducens nucleus is a center of horizontal conjugate gaze. What that means is when you activate abducens nucleus, your eyes, both eyes move towards the same direction, either to the left or to the right. And Let's say if you have a lesion in abducens nucleus, then what happens is your eyes cannot move to the ipsilateral side. So this is a video which we got from Nancy Newman and uh, Val Beals. And what you can see here. Look to the right. The patient is able to look now look to as the far right as you side. can to the left. Uh, cannot see to the right. Left. And as far as you can to the left. She also right has the, a problem please. with the VOR. Right at the camera. Uh huh. So with the VOR, there's no real change. Okay, look right. Camera. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Uh huh. Back center, other direction. Good, then that's perfect. One more. Uh huh. And look at the camera. Okay, good. So VOR and uh, saccades or uh, pursuit followed the very similar uh, trend that she could not move, your, move her eyes to the left side here. And when they did vertical eye movements, they were spared and virgins was also spared. As you can see in this. My finger, camera, my finger, camera. And Majid, would you just stand behind, please? Camera. She can have work. Camera, okay. Now look to the, look to the hammer over there. Okay, and look at the hammer. Okay, good. So what, you, what, what this tells us is if there is a lesion in the abducens nucleus, as you can see here, still the ocular motor nucleus and the virgin circuit is spared. And as a result, the eyes can have virgins, but it cannot have horizontal conjugate gaze. And this is a classic example of horizontal gaze palsy because of the left abducens nucleus lesion. Now let's say if you have a lesion in the connection between the abducens nucleus and ocular motor nucleus. So this patient over here, in that case, what you will see is the patient will not be able to adduct the eye, which is on the ipsilateral to the MLF lesion, but the patient will be able to abduct the eye in the opposite side. Uh, the same patient, when we ask that patient to do virgins, that will be intact. So here is an example of a patient okay. with intranuclear optomy. Look at my finger. That's a conjugate movement. Look at the camera. Finger, camera. 
finger, camera. And camera. White light, camera. So this is a classic example of the left INO in case of the left MLF lesion. Now, uh, this video actually came from one of my mentor, David Z. Um, this is a patient who had gaze palsy in the horizontal direction and also had scoliosis. Uh, all conjugate horizontal eye movements like saccade, VOR, and pursuit were absent. And what you can see here. Look up there. Good, look at the camera. And look at Dr. Moo over there. Look at, here, look at Tigger. Look at okay, and look at me. So she could not make horizontal saccades at all. She could not have a VOR or pursuit. Uh, she actually shifted her gaze to hey, make look a mom. All right, look at the camera. Look at the camera. Uh, she had normal vertical saccades. She had horizontal convergence that was also normal. Uh, she actually sometimes used virgins to shift the gaze, which was a very interesting learning that her brain had done. Her visual function was also normal, and she had progressive scoliosis, as you can see over here. Quiz. Localize. Oculomotor nucleus, obducens nucleus, obducens nerve, oculomotor nerve, and midline connections. Uh, we have a poll, right? Can we hear? So the answer is midline connections. So what happens is, uh, anybody knows the diagnosis? So basically what happens in these patients, the genetic mutation and what happens is lack of crossing fiber. So this is controls, and this is a patient who have horizontal gaze palsy and progressive scoliosis. And what you can see is that there are decussating quantine fibers here, which are present in normal people, which are absent in these patients. So what that means is they don't have any, um, any horizontal midline crossing, and as a result, her right side of the brainstem cannot talk to the left side. As a result, they cannot uh, move their uh, conjugate eye movements. And uh, this is a very well-known uh, mutation which uh, was described by my colleague Joanna Jan and Elizabeth Engel in 2004. Uh, and the mutation was localized to robo-3 gene, and it is on chromosome 11 Q23. Now, as a movement disorder neurologist, why this is important? So, as you know, that these patients also have bad scoliosis. And I think the paraspinal muscles on the right side do not communicate with that on the left side. So left side of the axial spine muscles don't know what is happening on the other side. As a result, they get scoliosis. And if you think about patients who have axial dystonias, they have done some st classic studies in 70s where they looked at the myographic activities on two sides of um, paraspinal muscles and there were asymmetry. So midline asymmetry in muscle tone is actually in heart of certain forms of dystonias. And uh, it's kind of food for thought that what is the role of the connection between two sides? Of course, there are not many theories on that yet, but something to think about for dystonias. So now uh, let's consider inputs for each functional classes of conjugate horizontal eye movements. So saccade inputs. So like I was telling you that saccades are probably, uh, not probably, they are the fastest eye movements that human make and they are the most prevalent eye movements that we make. In order to make saccades very fast, you need a lot of juice, you need a lot of electricity. You need to have um, at least 100 spikes per second or more. So when we used to record from non-human primate brains and their saccade generating areas, we always would get these cells which, are, which have very high firing rate. And, and that very high firing rate fuels enough 
uh, juice for that muscle to contract so fast to make rapid eye movement. And in order to do that, nature has designed a special machinery and that's called pyramidian pontine reticular formation. What these things have, they have burst neurons. They are called excitatory burst neurons. These excitatory burst neurons give very high firing rate and that then get transmitted to the obducens nucleus and that gives the very high velocities of saccades. So here is a picture from one of my colleagues, Jean butner Anover. So Jean uh, um, has demonstrated in her paper this excitatory burst neuron in the uh, PPRL. And um, of course, they have very high discharge rate, but then she also uh, showed a brain of the SCA2 patient. Of course, this is not the same brain, of course, but this is like she found a very identical looking area. Uh, into the burst neuron. And what you can see, you see the inclusions here. So this burst neuron here, which is normal, it is not there in SCA2. And as a result, they cannot generate good enough burst. So what happens, your saccades, of course, are not gonna be fast enough and they will be very slow. So this is a classic example of a patient who has SCA2 and what you are seeing is they are making a very slow saccade. So this is not actually a pursuit. The patient is, asked to make a saccade. So the quiz, who pioneered the description of SCA2? Thomas Brandt, Robert Daroff, Roshir Wadia, and Amitabh Bachchan. Any polls? Okay, so the answer is Noshiradia. And actually that came in a classic paper uh, by Wadia and Swami. Actually, SCA2 was called uh, Wadia Swami disease um, a long time ago, and that was described in 1971 in brain. That comes down to special case two. So this is a classic video many of you guys may have seen. The patient was of, uh, well-known neurologist David Kogan. And what you see here is the patient, or the patient is a baby, has this involuntary eye movements. Diagnosis. So the patient had neuroblastoma. So, uh, so what you saw were opsoclonus in neuroblastoma, but it's pretty classic. So whenever you see a young child who has this kind of erratic eye movement, you want to scan the brain, you want to send to ophthalmology, send to pediatric neurologist, take care of all those things, because that is very common cause for such opsoclonus in, in very young child. Uh, what are these? Basically, these are saccadic oscillations. So saccadic oscillations are back-to-back -back saccade without any intersaccadic interval. So there is one saccade which goes on the right side, and then there is one which, without any time, it goes back. And then when they are unidirectional, typically horizontal, they are called ocular flutter. And when they are multidirectional, horizontal, vertical, or torsional, and that's called obstacles. And of course, perineoplastic is one of the many etiologies of opsoclonus. So whenever you see opsoclonus, you want to send, make sure that you exclude some kind of cancer because that can be a lifesaver for your patient. And sometimes that can be a presenting feature. So this brings to a special case three, 45 year old woman with intermittent jitteriness and vision and persistent dizziness. She had subtle partial tremor, and that's why she came to the movement disorder clinic because of the tremor and some visual jitteriness. And when we looked at her eyes, it looked something like that. Eyes wide open.
So quiz, what do you see? Ocular flutter, opsoclonus, C sonostagmus, A plus B, Okay, I don't know if this polling is working so well. Um, so the answer is this patient had ocular uh, opsoclonus and CSON nystagmus. What you can see is that she had uh, eyes which are, so she's having this back-to-back back -back eye movements, uh, saccades, and they are in multiple dimensions. At the same time, she also has seesaw. So one eye goes up and it intrudes and then the other eye at the same time extort and vice versa. So this is a classic example where two phenomenologies were together. And uh, unfortunately, she was positive for ANNA1 antibody and she had breast cancer. And actually, this was the reason we uh, sent her for uh, to a cancer uh, doctors. And they found her breast cancer and she got chemo radiation she got treated, her eye movements got better. So careful examination of the eye movements actually saved this woman's life. So it's very important when you see these things, you want to be very prompt, you have to be, you have to be very um, aggressive in uh, looking for uh, cancers. Uh, now let's think about the vestibular inputs. So the obducens nucleus not only gets um, the uh, saccade input, but it also gets the uh, input from your vestibular end organs. Uh, and the vestibular end organ goes to the medial vestibular nucleus, and from there it goes to the obducens nucleus, and it makes a three neuron arch, neuron one, neuron two, and neuron three. And this three neuron arch is the most important for your um, vestibular ocular reflex. So let's say if you have a lesion in the medial vestibular nucleus, for example, in patients who have Wernicke encephalopathy, you can still see the not so fast. You are mm -hmm. now stop here. center and let's get a eyes wide open. Let's get a few thrusts. Head thrust. Good. Back to center. Other side is hyperactive. Back to center. Good. Back to center. Good. Back to center. One more. Couple more. Back to center. Uh, so that is your uh, Wernicke's encephalopathy and medial vestibular nucleus lesion. That comes down to another case. A middle-aged man presented with one-year history of brief episodes of vertigo and oscillopsia. Episodes of vertigo were induced by the sound. And what you can see here. Go to 110 dB. 2,000 hertz, 110 dB in the left ear. Hear the sound. Okay. Did you hear the sound? 2,000 hertz, 110 dB in the left ear. You just go on the stack. Go to 110 dB. So episodes of vertigo were induced by sound. What is your diagnosis? This is easy. So the diagnosis was semicircular canal dehiscence. Uh, with sounds that in the right ear, the eyes rotated up to the uh, and the top pole rotated to the left ear, which was a torsional eye movements, nystagmus, which was induced by the sound. And uh, the computer tomography showed a little niche, a little uh, leak in the uh, roof of the right anterior semicircular canal. It was dehiscent. And the phenomenology is called Julio phenomenon. Uh, which is also called semicircular canal dehiscence. Uh, it was extensively worked, done research on this topic by my colleague Lloyd Miner, and the video also comes from Lloyd. So now eye positions. So as we were talking, eye gaze holding is very important. And in order to hold the gaze, you need a mechanism in, in another area of the brainstem called nucleus prepositus hypoglossy. 
So this nucleus prepositus hypoglossy also feeds into the obducens nucleus and NPH actually works as a neural integrator, which means it takes the velocity of the eye and it converts it into position. And that is very important to hold gaze steady. Uh, and if you don't have NPH, then you may get also get gazy worm nystagmus. So in this lady who had lesion of NPH, you can see that she had the right beat when she looks to the right side. And when she would look straight, she does not have any rebound, which means that that is not cerebellar, but it is NPH deficits, and she had gazy worm nystagmus. And the pursuit inputs, pursuit goes to the medial vestibular nucleus and it is under control of the uh, ocular motor vermis. And from there it goes to the obducens nucleus. And if you have a lesion in this pathway, uh, for example, in patient who have SCA6, for example, over here you can see that they have atrophy of the cerebellar vermis and their pursuit is going to be abnormal. And you can see here. Right on it. Look at the tip of the pen. So as you can see, she's not moving it very, very smoothly. And her eyes are very choppy as she's following the pen. Mm -hmm. Okay, now look right at the tip of the hammer and move the head slowly now, back. Now, there's one thing right on that you want to consider as you are testing the pursuit is that often uh, the pursuit, saccadic pursuits are often seen in patients who have cerebellar lesions. Now, when patients have cerebellar lesions, they will also have nystagmus. Although not in this case, but we frequently see that. And if that happens, in that case, you have to be sure uh, that you are not having any kind of contamination from your nystagmus uh, that makes your pursuit, pursuit looks choppy. So in order to do that, what we do is we ask patients to kind of like follow the target as they are moving the head. So what nature has given a mechanism uh, called VOR cancellation. So as you're moving your head, but if target moves with the head, then nature gives a pursuit mechanism to cancel the VOR. In that case, you are checking the pursuit, although the gaze is always straight ahead. So if you don't have normal pursuit, in that case, your VOR cancellation will be abnormal. Look at the you will see that here in a second. And move the head slowly back and forth. With, yeah, that's so it. As we are doing Go that, the other direction now. Her gaze is not uh -huh. as steady, and she is actually right on it. back and forth. So pots. Real right on it. And that uh -huh. is. Keep your eye right on it. That Just a little. Now let's think of the vertical eye movements. So uh, there is no equivalent of medial longitudinal fasciculus to yoke all classes of vertical eye movements. So they are sort of independent. In order to make vertical gaze conjugate, each prenuclear input sends axon collateral to motor neuron supplying the uh, yoke muscle pair. So for example, uh, there is superior rectus and there is inferior oblique. These are two yoke muscles, right? So your innervation to the superior rectus, which is a primary elevator of the eyes, right? It gets input from cranial nerve third and uh, it gets these two inputs, two parallel inputs like this, and signals for upper saccade for the each eye then comes from area called rostral interstitial nuclear, um, medial longitudinal fasciculus, RIMLF, and that gives a parallel input to two sides of the innervating neurons. And so basically these burst neurons uh, send bilateral, uh, input to the motor neurons. And for inferior rectus, for the lower, uh, it also gets signal from the RIMLF, but that is ipsilateral. Uh, so signal specifying vertical eye position arise from the interesting nucleus of Cajal. So uh, it projects to motor neurons via posterior conjure and signal for upward eye position goes through that is so signal for upward eye position goes from the posterior commissure and downward eye position goes from posterior commissure and it goes ipsilateral so here is um, important thing so you, here is your interstitial nucleus of kahal right that gives uh, input uh, via this posterior commissure for upward and downward eye movement 
and it gives input to the ocular motor nuclei for the downward eye movement. So if you have some sort of lesion, let's say the pineal body, if it is creating a problem with the commissure here, in that case, you are interfering with this pathway, but you are not interfering with that pathway. And that happens when there's a tumor in the pineal nerve. They cannot look up because they don't have this, but instead they make a convergence movement uh, to, uh, to do that. So this is one of such patients, and as the patient is trying to look up, the patient is making convergence movement. But down is okay. When looks up, she makes a convergence movement, and down is okay. So this is a Paranaut syndrome. And when you do a optokinetic drum, they have what we call convergence retraction stagmus. So they, they, they have an stagmus, which is like eyes go in and out, in and out. So this is a classic video of Perinaut syndrome, and that is a pineal body tumor, which is interfering with this mechanism, this pathway here. Now this is something that we all see very commonly in our practice, progressive supranuclear palsy. So this patient has a normal horizontal eye movement, as you can see here, right? But when we ask the patient to look up, they are slow. And actually they are also curved, like the other patient that I showed you. And if you look at their brain, they have a very robust atrophy in the midbrain, what we call hummingbird sign in the MRI, and that is classic of progressive supranuclear palsy. So essentially, again, um, inferior nu uh, interstitial nucleus of Cajal, RIMLF, uh, they all go to the superior rectus, and then, uh, but vestibular ocular reflex don't have this uh, circuit, so vestibular ocular reflex can sometimes be intact in progressive supranuclear palsy. Uh, and uh, we know that pharmacological inactivation of RIMLF also causes slow or absent saccades in both up and down, but inactivation of INC causes limited range without slowing of any saccades. Uh, and that actually helps us distinguish uh, from limited upward gaze in healthy elderly subject uh, um, uh, because of some biomechanical uh, problems in orbit. So if there are some biomechanical problem in orbit, fibrosis, or some healthy people cannot even uh, make a full range of movement, in that case, you will see abnormal uh, VOR also. They, they will not have a full range. At the same time, they may not have, even have a saccade, unless PSP, unlike PSP. This is a, a, another quiz. Uh, so patient had rapid onset of Parkinsonism. He had frequent falls. He had double vision. On examination, he had normal or sort of slowish horizontal saccade, uh, and his vertical saccades were okay. Later on, everything was gone, and he also had diarrhea. So this is the stage when he did not have any saccades. So what you can see here, finger on your right side. Look at my finger. So Look at the camera. Not able to make any saccade to the right or Look left. Look at the finger on the left side. Look at the camera, finger, camera. Look up, camera. Look down, camera. Okay, now look at the camera. So as you can see, the VOR is intact. So VOR is intact, saccades are not abnormal. What is the diagnosis? Parkinson's disease, PSP, Whipple's disease, TB, multiple systems, atrophy.
Actually, this is not the right question you're pulling here. Um, oh, wait. This is actually. So, um, so 75% said Whipple's disease, which is the correct answer. Um, so let's go to the next slide. A 19-year-old girl, actually this is the patient that uh, I saw with my mentor, Melan DeLong, a 19-year-old 19, 19 girl who came to us for neck dystonia, head tremor, and oscillopsia. Uh, she actually came with a robust neck dystonia and she was very interested in getting deep brain stimulation done. And this is her brain. And what you can see here is that she had uh, some deposits in the uh, globus pallidum. And then um, when we look at her eyes, camera, finger, my finger, camera, finger. Uh, so what you are seeing in this video is that um, she, in addition to having not neck dystonia and head tremor, she also had this uh, pendular, uh, multi-directional, about four to five hertz oscillations of the eyes, uh, which is of course pendular nystagmus, as we know. And classic, classic example of pendular nystagmus is seen in multiple sclerosis. But this patient actually had uh, what we call OPED, oxidative phosphorylation electron transport chain deficiency, which is seen be, can be seen in what we call Lee's disease. And she actually had muscle biopsy and she did have Lee's disease. Uh, and she also had dystonia. She actually did get DBS, her dystonia got better, but her eyes uh, were, of course, not surprisingly, GPI is not gonna change her pendular nystagmus, so they were still the same. Uh, but she did improve with the GPI DBS for dystonia. Uh, another quiz, 82 year old man with a progressive falls, eyelid spasms and double vision. He came to my movement disorder clinic, I injected botulinum toxin in the eyelid, got better, um, but still of course he had some double vision which was persistent. What we are seeing here. The finger, keep looking at it. So you see keep this dissociated nystagmus on the left side. Look at the camera. Look at my finger, keep looking at it, keep looking at it, keep looking at it. Look at the camera. Now looking to the right side. Here, keep looking at it, keep looking at it, keep looking at it. Look at the camera. The finger. Look up. Vertical gaze camera. is abnormal, absent. Up. Camera. Down. Camera. Okay. Keep looking at the camera. Keep looking at the camera. Head UR is normal. Keep, head your, keep your head loose. So VOR is present. So I'm going to give you an answer, of course. So he had bilateral, wall-eyed, bilateral IA, no, what we call Wabino, and it was associated with dissociated nystagmus, pretty, which is pretty classic. The question is, what is your diagnosis? Parkinson's disease, PSP, Makado joseph disease, stroke, multiple sclerosis. Uh, and the poll.
Okay, so um, so these are the answers. What we found is five percent said Parkinson, twenty percent said PSP, twenty percent Makata Yosef, stroke thirty percent. MS 35%. So walleye bilateral INO, of course, it is a telltale for uh, midbrain stroke, so it is not a wrong answer, but this patient did not have that. Uh, multiple sclerosis, of course, it is a classic deficit in multiple sclerosis, but this patient did not have that. This patient actually had progressive supranuclear nuclear palsy. So, um, when we looked at his MRI, as you can see here, I mean, of course, he had a robust Parkinsonism. He had a progressive falls. He actually also had a uh, eyelid spasms and, uh, for some reason. Uh, the, the unusual thing about him was he had quick phases, which were intact uh, in the horizontal, um, um, but he did not have um, vertical eye movements. Uh, and as you can see in the MRI, he had a classic uh, midbrain atrophy, which was out of proportionately small compared to the pons. So, and he did have um, a Parkinsonism. Uh, and I think based on most other features he had, um, he was diagnosed with Parkin uh, PSP. I'm gonna briefly go through some cerebellar syndromes. Um, um, so there are three functional and anatomical cerebellar syndromes. So one is a syndrome of dorsal vermis and posterior vestigial nucleus, so which is a deficit over here in the cerebellum. Then uh, you get a, in, if you have that, you have a problem with saccharidic dysmetria. Then you have syndrome of floculus and parafloculus, which, is lo which localizes to here. And in that case, what you see is downbeat or gazy evoked rebound nystagmus or impaired smooth pursuit. And then you have a syndrome of nodulous ventral uvula, which is your vestibular cerebellum. In that case, you see positional downbeat nystagmus or periodic alternating nystagmus. So um, if you have a deficit in cerebellar warmness, you get undershooting saccades. So in this patient, uh, the patient has deficit here, which is ocular motor warmness. And you can see here- To my thing, that camera. Eyes wide, open, finger, camera, finger, camera, okay, finger, camera, finger, camera, finger, camera. Finger, camera. So he had undershooting of the saccades as a result of these deposits here. And then uh, if you have a cerebellar vestigial nucleus lesion, which is the area where the vermis is projecting to, you will see the opposite. You will see the overshooting of saccades. So over here, this person had a cancer here and he had a removal of the, uh, uh, of the deep nucleus. And in that case, what you see here is that he will have overshooting, hypermetrics. Nose, pen, nose, pen, nose, pen, nose. Uh, then a very classic flocular syndrome, which is a deficit in the flocculus parafloculus. For example, you can see that in many deficit, uh, but this is classic SCA6, where you have deficit in flocculus parafloculus. What you see is downbeat nystagmus, gaze evoked nystagmus, rebound nystagmus. So for example, this patient you have seen before, what do you see? So you see the eyes are beating to the right side, and then comes back to the center, and it's beating to the left now. Now it is beating to the left side, and when you go back to the center, it is gonna to beat to the right now. So this is a classic gazy nystagmus with rebound. You have seen that before. Uh, you have import VOR cancellation. So for example, the pursuit, so first he's doing pursuit, and as you can see that a pursuit is very choppy, it is saccadic pursuit. So pursuit is weak, so that saccad are intervening them. And when they do VOR cancellation, which we will do soon, 
So now we are doing VOR cancellation, and as they're doing VOR cancellation, the gaze is not remaining steady. That is suggestive of weak pursuit system. So this patient had abnormal pursuit system. Oops. Uh, so now coming to quiz. So I'm going to show you this patient. Tell me here. what you see here. Look down. Look at my nose here. Look down. Look at my nose here. And the same person. Nose. Finger. No. It's slow going. Yeah, seems like it is. Finger. Nose. Yeah. Finger. Nose. Finger. I'm playing you once again. Nose. See that? Finger. No. It's slow going. Yeah, seems like it is. Finger. Nose. There. Finger. There. Nose. So phenomenology, downbeat nystagmus, opsoclonus, seesaw nystagmus, A plus B or B plus C. Okay, so um, so twenty five percent said downbeat uh, downbeat nystagmus. Thirty eight percent said downbeat nystagmus plus opsoclonus, and thirty eight percent said downbeat nystagmus plus seesaw nystagmus. So this patient actually had downbeat nystagmus and opsoclonus, and let me uh, illustrate it here. So what you see in this video is downbeat nystagmus, down. right? Look at my nose here. So this is Look classic down. downbeat nystagmus. My nose here. She had a little bit torsion, I agree, but she does not have seesaw. My nose here. And then opsoclonus was a bit tricky, so there. Finger. So I will show you again. Yeah. It's slow going. Yeah, seems like it is. Finger. Nose. There. Finger. Nose. So obstacles, uh, when it is subtle, it's very difficult to pick it up. And typically what you want to see is when you want to see immediately after saccade, there would be a little jitter. And that is actually very sensitive Nose. of obstacles. So finger. look at that. No. It's slow going. Yeah, seems like it is. Finger. No. There. Finger. There. No. So whenever she makes a cod, she has a little jitter, and that's opsoclonus. So she had actually uh, syndrome of anti gad antibody, and it's very interesting. Uh, what we think is that uh, opsoclonus or ocular flutter, saccadic oscillations, are because of the excessive activity into the burst neurons, and, and that happens because of hyperexcitable state and that can be contributed by excessive glutamate. And since anti gad antibody uh, is there, it does not convert glutamate to GABA. So there's a lot of glutamate left over and that causes opsoclonus. Now that a lot of glutamate is there, but there is very little GABA because it's not being converted. So as a result, there's a functional lesion, so to speak, of the Purkinje cell, GABAergic 
of projection, and that leads to downward nystagmus. So that's what our uh, working hypothesis in these type of patients who have uh, anti-GAD antibodies, uh, who get downward nystagmus, and also obstaclonus, which is interesting. Uh, syndrome of nodulus and mantran uvula, which is very near and dear to my heart. These people get positional downbeat nystagmus. Uh, so this patient had a nodulus tumor. And what you see here, this is one of the Dave Z's patients. And okay, let's do it. Stable state. As she goes back, she has downbeat nystagmus and supine. So the downbeat nystagmus is only present when she's in supine orientation, but straight ahead she is normal. Gaze, which is a positional downbeat nystagmus, which is pretty classic. And that's why you want to make sure that whenever you see your patient, you have to check patients uh, who are dizzy people. You have to check them in um, supine, upright, right ear down, or left ear down positions. It's very important. It's very critical. Otherwise, you may miss positional downbeat nystagmus. Uh, in our world, in movement disorder, we have also seen positional downbeat nystagmus in patients who have multiple system atrophy. So it's very important for you uh, to do positional testing in your Parkinson patients. Um, and periodic alternate nystagmus is a very classic syndrome that you see with nodulus or ventral uvula lesion. It's so rare. I have seen only three or four of them so far. And what you can see in this classic video is this patient is looking straight ahead, eyes are beating to the left side, and then they are kind of getting slower. And then eventually they will stop. And as they stop, they will make a little bit of a vertical eye movements. You see that? And now they are going on the opposite direction. And this typically takes up to three to four minutes. So it, it cycle reverses. And of course, what we have seen is that uh, you want to take a look at the, the people's eye over time. And when you see the uh, variable trend, then you want to take a look at it for a relatively prolonged period of time. Uh, and although like it can go up to some minutes, I have seen people, some patients who had actually fast reversal of periodic alternating nystagmus. Uh, into a matter of several seconds up to a minute also. So it is also possible, and what we call is rapid cycling periodic alternating nystagmus, which is rare, but it is also possible. Uh, this slide has uh, different forms of spinal cerebellar ataxias. Uh, I'm not going to go through all of them. Uh, the classic ones is SCA3, where you see a slow saccade, I'm sorry, SCA2, Wadia and Swami disease. And what you see is patient is having slow saccades. You have just seen that a few slides ago. Patient is asked to make a saccade, not a pursuit there. And you can also even see around the houses there. Makada Yosef disease, where you can see hypoactive VOR and gazy nystagmus. So this is a patient who has hypoactive VOR, who has SCA3. Uh, in SCA3, another important thing you want to take uh, make sure is they also have some forms of dystonias. They can also have facial spasms. They can also have hemifacial spasm, blepharospasms. These are also quite common in these patients. And they also have a uh, ophthalmoplegia. SCA6 is another one where you can also see dystonias. Uh, in these patients, you typically would see downbeat, gazy or rebound nystagmus. I'm not gonna demonstrate them again because we have seen plenty of downbeats. And SCA3 will have slow saccades and they may have pigmentary uh, maculopathy. So it's very important that you do ophthalmoscopy on your patients who have ataxias because you can diagnose some form of ataxia without sending uh, pricey uh, genetic testing. And SCA8 is gazy nystagmus and saccadic dysmetria and they can also have some mild slowing. And you will have access to these slides um, on the video later on. So if you want to uh, study them, uh, you can have the, all the details here too. And remember, smooth pursuit is impaired in all SCAs. 
And there are some recessive forms of cerebellar ataxia, Friedrichs, which can cause square wave intrusion. So remember this video, this patient actually had Friedrichs ataxia. And as you can see, he had back-to-back, -back, uh, he had this saccadic intrusion. Close your eyes they gently. They were not quite back-to-back. -back. They were back-to-back uh, -back square wave. They were and like open square them up. Wave, macro square wave. Doing perfectly. Look at the camera. Um, there is ataxia with vitamin E deficiency and uh, A-beta lipoproteinemia can also mimic Friedrichs. Um, ataxia with impaired DNA repair, the classic one is ataxia telangiectasia. So in these patients, you see a uh, little uh, telangiectasia, as you can see here. Just look at my finger there. and look at the camera. And Look these the patients have all kinds of heterogeneous eye movement deficits. Camera. They have gazebo nystagmus, they have periodic uh, finger. nystagmus. Camera, just to show also the fixation. Hypometria, yes. hypometria. And we'll go here. Hypomotor apraxia. Finger. Camera. Camera. Wake, stay awake. Finger. Yeah. Camera. And now this finger. Okay. Uh, and another forms of, um, which is a cousin of ataxia telangiectasia, it is ataxia and oculomotor apraxia. Sure. This is the same Wait. patient you saw. Uh -huh. And look at me. Ataxia And look at your sister. This is and excellent. Look at me. You are seeing All right. And look at your mom. Okay. And look at me. So she's not able to make saccades, but instead of making a saccade, she's making head movements. So there is Friedrich ataxia. Um, so, that, so there are some other forms of spinal cerebellar ataxia which comes with vestibular loss. And in those cases, you want to take, uh, think of uh, Friedrich ataxia, SCA3, multiple systems atrophy, Wernicke's encephalopathy, Christopher Jakob, uh, superficial siderosis. So, for example, here you can see classic example of siderosis right there. Uh, and it can be idiopathic, or a very classic one is canvas, which is cerebellar ataxia, neuropathy, and vestibular areflexia, uh, which is a recessive disorder. They have progressive ataxia with the cerebellar signs, and they have profound cerebellar neuropathy, including uh, ganglionar neuropathy. They can have cough, loss of sweating, loss of bilateral vestibular function, and smooth pursuit. This is a video which, uh, which I got from my colleague, David Shmulovics. Uh, and what you are seeing here is this patient has canvas. And uh, making a pursuit. Which is choppy. Vertical, it is also same. And the VOR is hypofunctioning here. So this is a classic of canvas. Now, actually, I want to uh, bring up a very important um, experience that I once had. So you know, whenever somebody comes with uh, cerebellar ataxias and all these different ocular motor deficits, we send uh, uh, a panel, a, uh, a panel which is reversible forms of ataxias, right? And there is uh, we send the vitamin levels, we send heavy metals. So uh, I sent heavy metal in one patient and it became positive. And then like we wondered what was the problem. It turned out 
that if patient eats shellfish, like uh, shrimps or any such kind of food, seafood, which comes from the seafood, like salt water, they can sometimes have heavy metal, which is falsely positive. And uh, so you want to, once you get that, you tell your patients not to eat seafood and come back in a month, uh, and then you retest them, and my patient was actually negative for that. So it's, it's some, some interesting lesson that I learned from that patient. So it's something to keep in mind. Uh, we are almost towards the end. Uh, this is a very special thing, which is near and dear to my heart, which typically develops within a week following a brainstem stroke. So this was a young man in his teenage, was in college and had a AVM rupture, as you can see here. And then uh, he was in the ICU, got excellent care, and then came to our dizzy clinic. And when Dr. Lee was actually seeing him, we saw these deficits in his eyes. What you see here, he has a quasi-sinusoidal, disconjugate, bilateral oscillations of the eyes. When you see that, never miss to look at the palate. So when you look at the palate, we are seeing this. What you see here is the palatal myoclonus. So he has ocular tremor and he has a palatal tremor. And the diagnosis is oculopalatal tremor. Quiz, where does it localize to? So um, oculopalatal tremor localizes to the inferior olive and most of the um, attendees uh, gave the right answer, which is great. Uh, it is pretty classic of inferior olive lesion and actually it was described by two very clever French scientists, Gullion and Mollaret. And they described a Gullion Moller triangle which connects inferior olive to the deep cerebellar nuclei. And from deep cerebellar nuclei, these fibers go on the superior cerebellar peduncle. They actually loop around the red nucleus. They don't synapse at the red nucleus and go into the central tegmental tract. So when you have a lesion in the central tegmental tract in our poor patient that was AVM rupture, what happens is inferior olive get hypertrophied. It's actually degenerative hypertrophy. So it's called pseudo hypertrophy. And that's a classic pathognomonic feature of oculopalpal tremor. Uh, this is my favorite part. So my question to you is, what does this man have?
So diagnosis, opsoclonus, CSO nystagmus, Gazebog nystagmus, I don't know. So, um, so a lot of you guys said that, um, is this lecture going to get over? Yes, it is. Oops, what happened? So this man had uncanny ability to make these eye movements discover interlatching circuit of the basal ganglia, describe contemporary physiological theories of Parkinson's disease. Really, I don't know the answer. Discovered the basis of pallidotomy and deep brain stimulation. He won Lasker Award. He won Breakthrough Prize for all of the above. He's none other than my mentor and my hero, Melan DeLong. So he had this uh, interesting way uh, to, um, Um, move his eye movements in a very funny ways. Uh, and he's just an amazing guy. And anyways, I want to thank you all for being here. And uh, this is it. So we want to see the questions. Is there the Q&A? Uh, yeah, can sure. We can take a few questions. Uh, Maybe maybe a couple maybe a couple people sitting around so we can take. Uh, but remember, Asif, uh, uh, it must be almost uh, one a.m. for you. No, I'm good. <laughs> okay, <laughs> thank you for doing it at this time. It was an amazing talk. Uh, Minakshi, you can take the question. Yeah, him... yeah, yeah. Asif, can you read the questions? Is there the no? I cannot. To... One second. What should I? Where should I go? Okay, I can, um, I can, I can read this. Oh, here, read question and answers. Here, here, here. I got it. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh, so, uh, four, five. Hmm. so can I go from top to bottom? Uh, yeah, whatever. Masif, uh, okay. Let Minakshi ask you the questions. Okay, sure. You want me to? Okay, fine. Okay, one is somebody wants to know: Is the serpentine sign a combination of side-to-side -side tremors or vice the up and down movement? Yeah, so um, that's correct. So actually, we did um, look into it very carefully. We quantitatively measured these eye movements, and it's actually not the tremor of the eyes. So eyes don't have tremor. Uh, originally, when I first saw that clinically, uh, I thought that this is a mixture of up and down eye movement with a uh, mixture mixed with a square wave jerks, which is very common in um, patient who have a PSP. But it turned down. It turned out that it's actually a maladaptive phenomenology. So when we measured their eye movement with a high resolution uh, oculography, we found out that it's not just the mixture of a square wave with vertical saccades. It's actually maladaptive phenomenon. As a result, the brain cannot program the trajectory in the most optimal way, and it becomes um, irregular. Okay, uh, Minakshi. Uh, you can start your yeah. video also, and uh, Asif, can you stop sharing the screen? Uh huh. So we can everybody can see you better. Sure. And then see so, okay, let's go to the next question. How do okay. I stop next sharing? Next question is a question about the button there. Just click. Just stop click on stop share. Oh, stop share. Okay, got it. Yeah. Right. So the next question is about how do you differentiate a PPRF lesion from an abduse and nerve nucleus lesion? Yeah, so uh, PPRF lesion. So PPR pyramidal point auricular formation. So what it does, it it, it is going to give you a uh, slowing of saccades, and um, it's actually going to no matter which direction it is, it's going to be the 
it's going to be the same amount of slowing. So that's one thing, of course. And you can also look at the VOR because uh, VOR is not going to involve uh, PPRF. It's going to, uh, while VOR is going to involve abducens nucleus. So if you do head impulses and if head impulses are normal, uh, then it is a saccade generating mechanism, but uh, head impulses are also abnormal, uh, then it, it has to be further downstream. So in other words, what we call a final common pathway. So final common pathway is a saccade pursuit VOR. They all then go into one pathway and then it goes to the eyes and abducens nucleus is actually in the final common pathway. But as of, isn't it true that in an abducens nucleus lesion, the primary position of the eye would be a little adducted? Yes, Not it is so possible because, yeah, because uh, herring's law, right? It's going to be a little bit, right, yes, yeah. it is possible, yeah. Okay, we'll just take the last question, then you can maybe ask them to send the questions over on email or something. Sure, the I'm happy to answer any questions on email. Yeah. yeah, what is the difference between semicircular canal dehiscence and perilim fistula as far as clinical signs are concerned? It's about very similar. It's very similar. Uh, actually, another classic thing that you want to uh, consider for dehiscence or fistula is, uh, um, actually, Dave Z has a very classic video of it. I don't know if he shared it with you guys, but what you see is that when you do um, uh, knee-jerk reflexes or if you do vibrate there, uh, any bone, he actually sent me once a video where you vibrate the patella and you see the nystagmus. So these are pretty classic things. Um, fistula can be like it's just it's just like in a different uh, different location. Uh, uh, I have uh, uh, maybe the, before your next talk, I will share a video. Fistula can be lateral canal also. Yeah, you may get horizontal nystagmus, while superior semicircular canal descents, of course, is only vertical and torsional. Yeah. So it's just more specific yeah. to a canal rather than, you know, that can be, the fistula can be anywhere, yeah. And in a fistula, okay. you can do the Hennebert sign. I have got a video where the patient, I'm pressing the tragus in and the tragus, whenever I press, causes a lateral So I will show like that. Yeah. So I will show that next time. Just press the tragus and the patient gets okay. I think I think we should allow Asif to go take a break. Yes, Asif, you should sleep now. This okay. was fantastic. Yeah. Thank you, thank you.